Welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar, Effective Strategies for Mathematics with Kara Shores. Um, so Kara has been joining, is joining us from near Atlanta, Georgia, and she is an expert on response to intervention and responsive teaching, and is going to be sharing that expertise with us this evening from, um, well, from her home. So welcome, Kara. I'm going to I'm going to put a little link in the chat window as well, where people can go and get the um, handouts and resources from today's presentation. And I can give that again at the end as well. So go ahead, Kara. I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Carla. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be with you this afternoon. And uh, yes, I am from uh, near Atlanta, Georgia, and it is nice and uh, summertime weather here. So I hope it's warmed up for you guys a little bit. Um, we are uh, going to be talking about RTI. Oh, Carla says, no, it's not warm there. So sorry, guys. <laughs> it's really nice here. Um, we are going to be talking about RTI for mathematics this afternoon and uh, strategies for looking at math. And uh, so um, without further ado, we will get started. As we look at um, the RTI process, we're going to be looking, uh, just to give you an overview here, we're going to be looking at basic uh, learning strategies that can be used in math. Um, looking at assessment that we use, and uh, in everything that we do um, with RTI, um, we're looking at explicit, direct, systematic instruction for our students. Um, so we're going to be exploring ways um, to do that and to be able to provide that to students um, who are in all classes through Tier 1 and then students who are struggling. Now I'd like to begin by um, just getting an idea of who is with us today. There are some uh, familiar faces to the names here, but I would like to know uh, the background of everyone. So if you could use the voting buttons um, there underneath the names and tell me what um, your current role is in RTI, and I'll give you just a ticket. All right, so it looks like we have teachers and some division staff and uh, learning coaches and also um, uh, some mathematics consultants. So great, we have a wide um, spread of, um, of participants this afternoon, so um, that helps me to know uh, how to respond to questions and things like that, so thank you very much. Now, as we begin, um, we're going to look first off um, at where do we focus interventions for students. The RTI process <clears throat> is not simply reteaching core instruction. Um, we want core instruction um, to cover all appropriate areas in math. But when we um, have students who are struggling, the focus of our interventions in Tier 2 especially, um, somewhat more comprehensive in Tier 3, but in Tier 2, just as we do in reading with focusing on the five areas of reading, in math we focus on very specific skills that students should be acquiring. In grades 1 through 4, we are looking at getting students um, to have proficiency and fluency with whole numbers. Um, so learning the basic algorithms of, of basic functions, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and understanding the meaning of those operations. It's not just a, a, a process of memorizing facts, but really understanding the meaning behind what they are doing so that when we get through grades 5 and 8, um, we can move on with problem solving, uh, word problems, at a higher level and higher reasoning, and also with proficiency in um, fractional and rational numbers. Um, when we're looking at um, findings of research on math um, and students who are struggling in math, um, research tells us that one of the main reasons that students have difficulty in high school algebra specifically, but in all higher math, is a lack of fluency in decimals and fractions. And so beginning in grade five and moving up, we want to make sure that we are working toward fluency in those um, fractional numbers, uh, decimals, ratios, um, and fractions. Um, so that should be the focus of our intervention process. Um, as I said, especially for Tier 2, Tier 3 students um, who are 
um, have significant learning needs, um, many times we'll need an overall comprehensive approach to math. Um, but with Tier 2, we really want to focus on these specific areas. As I said, just as we do in reading with the five areas, we want to do that in math as well. I've given you in the PowerPoint today um, multiple resources for looking at um, at uh, research as well as um, what research says works. Um, and so there are two resources that I've listed here for you. Um, when we're looking at the um, Doing What Works website that's listed first, um, this is one of my favorite websites for math. It is a great place for going to look um, at what is recommended from research as far as working with students in math and also has sample lesson plans. Um, they have a specific um, uh, case studies from schools um, to show how schools are implementing math interventions for struggling learners. So that is a great site and that is the Doing What Works um, site that is listed there. And then the Center on Instruction is another of my favorites. It really goes more into um, the heavy research and um, providing an overview of research in reading and math. Um, but um, specifically today we're focusing on that math and you'll find lots of resources there. This is a screenshot of the Doing What Works site and you can see that they have a um, an area that focuses on response to intervention in elementary and middle math and when you um, go to that site then you'll find multiple resources. They have um, four specific strands focusing on screening and monitoring, foundations, intentional teaching, and RTI implementation. And then when, within each of those, you'll find additional resources. This is in the um, Foundations of Arithmetic. And you can see that they have a practice summary. Um, then they have Learning What Works, which is um, more of what does research tell us works. And then you have to see how it works, and they'll sometimes show clips from classrooms. Um, and then do what works, giving you sometimes lesson plans. And you can see down on the bottom left corner the site profiles that will give you specific information from schools. Uh, from schools. So this is a very helpful site um, for looking at what our school is doing. Now, is this elementary and middle math? There are resources on this site for high school as well. Um, they're just in a different um, part and aren't always related specifically to RTI, but it is on good math instruction. This is a screenshot from the Center on Instruction, um, the other site that I talked about. And at the Center on Instruction, you can um, specifically look at uh, mathematics. They have, as you can see on the side there, they have um, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, or our STEM uh, subjects, and then English Language Learning, Special Education, and a specific um, link for RTI. So there are lots of resources there as well. Here are some additional resources for interventions. Um, the um, second one there, I haven't given you that, and that is the bestevidence.org. That is from Johns Hopkins University and does um, a um, role of rating programs. Um, the one just above that, ies.ed.gov, is also um, a, a U.S. Department of Ed site, just as the Doing What Works site. In fact, it's the home site for Doing What Works, and it's called the What Works Clearinghouse. And they have some tool charts that rate um, screening tools, um, programs, um, has very helpful information. Um, and then there is a site listed there, um, the ceHS.unl. That's the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and they have some specific uh, interventions that can be used. Um, and then illuminations, I will talk to you a little bit later on using that for virtual representations, but it also has some good um, resources. So we're going to give you about three minutes um, for you to um, look at these um, sites, um, and you can uh, link to them, and Carla will give you some specific information on how to do that. Thanks, Kara. So yeah, just a quick little time for you to explore uh, before Kara moves on. So I'm just going to put the links into the chat window. Some of them are there already, um, so you can scroll up and down. And anything that's underlined blue is a live link in the chat window. They're not live on Kara's slides in this environment. Um, so once you click on them, your web browser will open, and you can then explore that web page.
I'll put up a little timer, and then when the timer dings, we'll ask you just to come back. Um, and we know it's just a very short, um, short time to have a look at them, um, but it just gives you a little taster and ones that you can, you know, decide to to spend a bit more time to visit again. So there's a few of them. I'm, I'm sorry these didn't go in as live links, so I'll just do that again. To bear with me. Um, but again, the doing what works. Um, that website is is in there already, and you can carry on continue looking at those as well. So I'll just put those links in and I'll turn my mic off. Welcome Val. We're just getting people a little bit of time to have a look at a few um, RTI resources. So I'm just putting in the links in the chat window and people are going to be going off to uh, visit these in a second. So I've just put the timer on for just a couple, two and a half minutes, just to give you, like I said, a little sampler to have a uh, quick check over some of those. And when the timer goes, we'll just ask that you return, and we'll look to move forward. But if you do have questions or comments about any of those resources, please do let us know. I've still got one or two links left to put in there. So again, welcome back everybody, and I know Carol will be happy to take some questions or comments if you have any, so you can do that um, either by raising your hand or typing them in the chat window. Um, just likewise as well, in case you missed it earlier, um, you can download these slides so you'll have access to all these links and resources quickly and easily from the urlc.wikispaces.com slash RTI. So thanks Kara, go ahead. All right. Does anyone have any questions about those um, those websites? Okay. Well, we will move forward. And if you do have questions, you just feel free to raise your hand or type those in. Um, we're going to begin looking at first off some math intervention programs. We're going to talk just for a, a very brief minute about some programs that are uh, for purchase, and then we're going to move on to talking about math. Uh, uh, research-based interventions that you can use with program materials that you already have. As we look at math programs, I would like to do another um, poll. So if you would look at these, at the names of these programs and, um, and vote uh, any of these programs that you've used. Okay, we have Dreambox um, by a couple folks. More than one of the above, Power of 10, none of the above, Academy of Math. And again, you can vote if you, with the little, um, yeah, and people are chatting in as well, vote with the little um, polling tools below the list of our names. So I'll publish these to the whiteboard, but it gives us a little idea that some of them are being used. Okay. All right. Um, when we're looking at these, we're going to talk very briefly, as I said, about some of these um, tools. And then I will um, ask that if you have used them and you would like to make a comment to the group, that you just type those in and we'll make sure everyone sees those. Um, as we look at Academy of Math, Academy of uh, Math is a program that is um, a um, computer-assisted instruction. Um, and it is individualized and designed for students um, who are receiving interventions. Um, Alberta Distance Learning Center offers Academy of Math, and so it, it is available to you through that, um, that venue. Um, <clears throat> it is um, basically for students who are receiving interventions. Academy of Math has, um, uh, it incorporates higher order thinking, and so when we're looking 
at higher order tasks for students. These are based on the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics um, process standards. And so it builds skills in each of these um, six areas. When um, we look at um, the Academy of Math program, it is designed to um, teach vocabulary to students um, and um, do that through tutorials. Um, it will test on the vocabulary once it has um, completed the tutorial on that. And then it moves to operations and, again, uh, quizzes students on their functioning uh, in the um, uh, math operations and then moves on to words, word problems. So it does incorporate all of those higher order thinking skills in. When you're looking at Academy of Math, um, it begins with a placement test for every student. And because it is online instruction, um, then students uh, are all started at their individual placement levels. Um, you then get results uh, individually on students. And the teacher also gets school results, um, class results, and school results that can be used there. So it does your progress monitoring for you. And, um, and basically takes care of the, uh, the progress monitoring portion of um, the RTI process. Um, it is from school specialty and, um, as I said, is available through the Alberta Distance Learning Center. Um, Dreambox, uh, I'm going to turn over to Carla and let her um, give me some information about Dreambox. Hi. Um, Thanks, Kara. Just in relation, we had a couple of questions about um, the Academy of Math. And so, yes, um, I put in a link earlier about the Alberta Distance Learning Center. So if you do have junior or senior high students who are registered for distance learning, they can access Academy of Math um, through there. So there is some information on, um, on this website if that is something that would be appropriate for some of your students. Uh, Dreambox. Similar type of program as the Academy of Math um, because, again, it is online based where you have, um, where you are able to track your students. Um, I do not, I'm not sure if this one is, if Dreambox is available in French, but I know Power of 10, the next next one is available in French. Again, it has the pre-test um, so that students don't have to cover content that they already have. Um, you know, there is uh, the primary and intermediate, and you can go online to their website and have a little trial if, um, if that is a appropriate for you. You can see um, it doesn't give you a great sample, but you can see what it would be like. Um, and again, there's different sort of pricing options for these depending upon, um, you know, students and what kind of license you decide to get. Likewise as well, there's just a screenshot of one of the activities. Um, but this is sort of when you get it, you can have you know an administrator dashboard. You can see sort of where students are at. Uh, but you also get a teacher dashboard, so you can see sort of um, how students are doing per object objective. Um, and then you can also get sort of a student printout as well. So you get you do get a lot of that feedback, and it can make um, progress monitoring uh, a little bit uh, easier. And again, with, with it being technology-based, there's often some enthusiasm um, and engagement for the students. The, I'll just quickly talk to the Power 10, and then we'll ask as well if people would also like to give some feedback. I know Carla Kozak is a numeracy uh, math consultant sorry, for Edmonton Public Schools, so she might be able to give us some um, idea of how it, things have been working out for people. Um, the Power of 10, this one is available. Some parts of it are available in French, not the whole series just yet. Um, and again, it's not particularly um, designed exactly for RTI, but it certainly does highlight um, research-based and brain-based strategies for teaching um, mathematics. So yes, you can use part of it to supplement your um, main curriculum or you could also use parts of it for small group interventions. Um, it doesn't include any of the formal um, progress monitoring tools, so you would need to um, you know, adapt it and use something other ways to um, assess students. Um, again, it's sort of got four main parts. I won't go over um, all of these in great detail. Um, but again, it's sort of, like I said, it, it's supplemental to what you are already doing. 
And so that, that takes us to the end of sort of those, those three main, not, those, not the main ones, there's many, many programs that you can purchase, but we just sort of highlighted three here. I know um, somebody had put, said in they were doing um, Mathletic. I know one school in Legal is using SuccessMaker, which is an online one. So I'm just going to um, turn my mic over and see if Carla Kozak would just give us a little bit of feedback from um, how schools are working out with some of these products. Thanks, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Uh, can you hear me? OK, I see a happy face, so that looks good. Um, welcome, everyone. It's pretty exciting to be part of this. Hi, Kara. Nice to be here. Uh, I can talk, first of all, to Dreambox. Dreambox was something that um, we got involved in as a pilot project because Pearson was um, um, representing Dreambox and trying to implement uh, that program into Canada. And unfortunately, um, as of I think this September, Dreambox then pulled out of the Pearson support and is now operating only Dreambox on its, on its own. So I'm actually not sure if you can access it being Canadian. I know that schools that signed up last year were able to be grandfathered in, uh, although I'm sure Dreambox will change the pricing that Pearson had arranged with them. But unfortunately, um, it, it might be, you might actually have some issues with, with getting the Dreambox program. That being said, Dreambox, um, if you do have a chance to look at it, and if they have changed that in the last six months since I um, haven't updated myself on that, um, it is an amazing program in that, as Carla mentioned, there is the dashboard for teachers to see the, the students' progress. And um, it is, it's an amazing uh, teaching strategy as well. What I like about Dreambox um, more so than the Academy of Math is it's actually set up um, teaching strategies. So it teaches students as they're um, working their way through the different questions and activities it actually has them, um, you know, um, testing out different different ways of thinking of solving the problem. So I, I like that piece with Dreambox, and it's quite motivating. And in fact, children have access to it through a home um, password as well. And you know, kids once they get on it, it's they they go crazy with it. So Dreambox is is good if you can get your hands on it. Um, Power of ten. Uh, what I can speak to with Power of Ten is, I, I agree, I think it's one of those strategies that we'll see it at all tiers of the pyramid, um, depending on the level of the student and um, what, what the goals are that you're working with. I think sometimes, you know, you might have a child in grade six who needs a very targeted uh, support that the Power of Ten cards or the system, the Power of Ten games um, help with basic facts. So that is, uh, that is where I see Power of Ten. I, and again, it's about motivating kids because the activities are meaningful and um, they're engaged playing games. So it's, uh, Power of Ten, I think, is another great strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Carla. Um, and if you do want to find out further about specific programs, um, if you will go to the ies.ed.gov website, the uh, What Works Clearinghouse, um, they have a review of both math and reading programs there. That's a good starting place to look at what, what is available. Um, so we are um, looking at, um, you know, programs that can be used, purchased by your school system. Um, someone mentioned SuccessMaker, and it is good. It is by Pearson, and there's a link to it there in your window. And um, so um, that one, Academy of Math, I'm, I'm uh, pretty familiar with Academy of Math through School Specialty and EPS. Um, they do the progress monitoring for you and have um, uh, many different resources. So if you are looking at computer-assisted instruction, either one of those would be very appropriate for you. Um, we're going to move on now and start looking at research-based learning strategies, um, which can be used um, with students in Tier 1 in the uh, full curriculum, but also as a supplement in your intervention tiers. And when we look at 
um, research-based learning strategies for math. We don't have the wide variety that we do um, with reading. And in some ways, that's not good. But in some ways, it is good. Because if you know um, these specific strategies, then you can do a lot with them. We're going to focus on these strategies today. These were um, our recommendations from what is the best uh, that research tells us works best with students. So we're going to talk about each one of these today. Um, when we're looking at strategies with students, basically we want to provide a variety of strategies, giving students multiple ways to work a problem, um, multiple ways to solve a word problem, um, but then focusing on very explicit instruction in how to use each one of those strategies. So I've given you an example here that for a student who's learning multiplication facts, we would work on memorization. We would also use manipulatives to make sure that the student understands the concept and can link <coughs> that very concrete manipulatives to the abstract of the actual fact memorization. And then teaching students to decompose numbers, um, as I've shown you here. Um, when we're learning those facts, looking at it as not just 12 times 5, but 10 plus 2 um, times 5, and then um, to use our order of operations um, to solve that. So teaching students a multitude of ways to, um, to solve a problem um, can be very important. Our first strategy that we're going to talk about is think alouds. Think alouds are used uh, in reading, math, really all content areas um, to look at the essential understandings, uh, the reasoning behind um, the math process that we're talking about. Think alouds um, should be done by teachers as well as students. Um, teachers thinking aloud, the process is in an example that I have for you here. Um, this is estimating an answer to a problem, 12 plus 17. And looks, my uh, um, uh, problem got a little off there. Sorry about that. Um, but if you look on the right, you will see what a think aloud would be in terms of um, talking about this process. It is basically taking all the things that we do um, without thinking about them and making them uh, metacognitive so that students hear our reasoning while we are solving the problem. So instead of just saying, I want to estimate the correct answer to this problem, we would say aloud to the student, what does estimate mean? And rather than having the student answer it, we're just simply going to think aloud what our thought process are. It means that I'm going to make my best guess at what the answer to my problem might be. Why should I want to estimate rather than add it together? What if I have a large number and I can't add it in my head? So this is a think aloud, an example of a think aloud that a teacher would use. And then when we turn that and have the student think aloud how they are solving the problem, we want them to do the same thing. Give us the reasoning behind what they're doing. You can look for error patterns there. You can make sure that the student doesn't have um, um, errors in their reasoning and can address those very easily in that way. Think aloud should be used with students on an ongoing basis, as I said in Tier 1, as well as in the intervention tiers. Um, a very powerful tool that we can be using um, with students. Our next strategy is to explicitly teach math vocabulary. And research tells us um, that we have to teach vocabulary in every content area, and that many of our vocabulary words are content specific. And that is especially true in math. And so we have to teach that in a way that students can learn that. Um, the most commonly used tool and uh, one of the most successful tools is a Freer model. We talked about this last week in the reading um, workshop. And then again, today we see it. Um, there are two keys to using a Freer model. And that is, um, number one, the student should put the definition in their own words. This should not be copying a definition out of the book or out of a dictionary. And so we want the student to put the definition in their own words. And secondly, we want them to come up with some sort of representation of that word or that definition that makes sense to them. So in the characteristics column, a student might actually draw a picture, make a pictorial representation um, to show what they are, um, are associating with that word. Many times when I use the Freyer model, I go through the characteristics, the examples, and the non-examples first, and then come back to um, the definition uh, so that they can put it in their own words with their understanding. I've given you some examples here of a Freyer model used uh, in a math class. This would be a high school math class where they're learning the six basic functions. And this one is for a quadratic. 
and then an inverse. And these are student um, uh, work samples um, where the students did um, work through um, the definition and come up with the definition on their own. There is um, an example of using a Fourier model that Carla has put on your screen there. And um, you can look at how that is used in the classroom. Once again, in Tier 1 with all students, but also in our intervention tiers, um, explicitly and directly teaching that vocabulary to students. Our next strategy is called Concrete Representational Abstract, or CRA. And our um, looking at um, CRA, many times we use manipulatives to teach students um, math problems. And um, when we use those manipulatives, many times, instead of making a connection to the problem, we simply jump straight to that abstract problem. And students have difficulty making the connection between the concrete and the abstract. So as we're looking at um, the CRA, um, we have to put in the representational using something to make that connection. A number line, tally marks, um, something to be a, a uh, connection between the concrete and the abstract. So as we're looking at um, CRA, I've given you an example here of what that instruction might be for multi-digit addition. In a core classroom in Tier 1, um, we might do this with all students for three or four problems when we first introduce a concept. But as we're using this in our intervention tiers, we need to take students through multiple problems, working the problem concretely, representationally, then abstractly. Then go to the next problem, work it concretely, representationally, and abstractly. So in this example, we might use bundled up pencils or straws or something to show our, um, our place value and um, uh, being able to see the actual numbers that we are adding together. And then we would go to a, perhaps a number line for students to count and add those numbers. And then we could actually go to a word problem or just um, the, uh, the math um, problem itself and be able to work that. So as we're looking at CRA, many times um, teachers uh, like to use virtual representations in that middle step. And this is especially useful um, for um, older students when we're talking about higher order math. So this is a website from the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics um, that has many activities, but some of those um, looking at them as virtual representations. Now I want to take just a, a second here. Um, I'm not real good about talking and looking at the questions here, so I just finally noticed that um, Carla asked a question, has anyone used the Freire model in math? Um, can, if you would give me uh, just a raise your hand or a smiley face um, if you have used the Fourier model in math. Okay. We've got a few people that have. Um, I do encourage you to do that um, when you are looking at um, your math vocabulary. As, as Carla Kozak said, it is a, a difficult um, um, thing to sometimes teach math vocabulary because it doesn't transfer to any other content areas. Sometimes science, but oftentimes it's only in math that we see specific vocabulary words. All right, um, we're going to move on now and talk about schema-based instruction. This is um, one of the more complex strategies that we have and um, really is an entire process of teaching. It's a, sort of a, um, a methodology for teaching math problem solving. Um, it goes back to metacognitive thinking and teaching students um, problem solving strategies. And schema-based instruction is actually used in um, many areas, not just in math. But in math, um, we use it by teaching students to recognize a visual that represents a type of math problem. So I've listed here for you five different types of problems used in schema-based instruction. A change, compare, group, multiplicative compare, and vary problems. So I'm going to show you some examples of these. 
And then I'm going to give you a, a resource. Um, if you're going to use schema-based instruction, I really recommend that you get the resource that I'm going to show you here or something very similar um, because it is um, um, really a methodology that you need um, lots of information about. This is a change problem. Um, and students would recognize that we have one thing in the beginning, we end with something else, and we're trying to find out what the change was in the middle. Um, so we would teach students to recognize a change problem by looking at the words and associating it with this graphic. A grouping problem, there's an example of that, taking multiple amounts and adding them together is an example of grouping. A compare problem is when we are um, oftentimes looking at larger and smaller and finding the difference. Multiplicative compare can get into ratios and percents. And then a vary problem um, might be an if-then. There are many ways to look at vary problems. So you can see that there is a, a, um, a visual that goes with each one of the different types of problems. Um, I do recommend this resource um, for anyone who is interested in looking at schema-based instruction. It says it's to be used with middle school students, but my son actually was taught schema-based instruction when he was in second grade, and I've seen it used all the way up to high school. Um, so it is a good resource um, that is available from Guilford Press. And um, Carla says it is available on Kindle for $15. That's a, that's a great buy. <laughs> I think that's a lot less than I paid for it. Thanks, Kara. Um, I just had a quick question. I'm going to go back a couple of slides. I, I do like these visuals. Um, so I'm just wondering, is it sort of best practice that a teacher provides the visual, or is that kind of like the scaffolding? Uh, initially um, provide the visuals and then gradually take them away, and students are encouraged then to draw their own? Or what's kind of the, the sort of process behind it? Yes, Dr. Jatendra in her work recommends that you, you give the visuals up front until students become very familiar with the, um, the process and then they can uh, draw their own or be able to do it without drawing the visuals. But um, these are some visuals that um, my co-author and I made up for um, our school improvement book. Um, Dr. Jatendra has many visuals that she uses in her book. And if I remember correctly, um, I I think um, there may be some uh, digital uh, resources that go along with um, the um, um, book there. And Pius, I don't know if it's available for anything other than Kindle. I'm not sure. Um, Carla can probably look on Amazon or Nook or whatever. Um, OK. So yeah, so, um, as we're I was looking, just going to say, sorry, yeah, you, I don't, I didn't check the others, but I know, like on my iPad, I just have the Kindle app, and the Kindle app is free, and then you have to create a Kindle account, and then you can download everything uh, from Kindle that you want. So, so yeah, I, it may be on iBooks, or it may be on Kobo, but I don't know for sure. Uh, you could check it out, but certainly I know what Quick Checks that it was fifteen dollars on um, on Kindle. Also, if you look at resources by Dr. Jatendra, her name is Asha, A-S-H-A, um, Jatendra. Um, she has uh, many articles and a couple more books on schema-based instruction that are available. All right, um, another strategy that we're going to look at is when teaching fractions using linear models rather than our traditional pie or pizza. Um, there's strong research that says that students um, have difficulty making the connection between whole numbers and fractions and decimals, and one of the reasons is because of the way we teach fractions, um, and that if we use a, um, a number line to teach fractions, that students have an easier um, job making connections. You can see there in the research information that I've presented to you um, that it really is looking at what is called number density. That understanding that there are multiple numbers between any two whole numbers. And so as we're looking at linear models for fractions, one of the most common ways 
that we teach that is looking at using a fraction wall. And in this example, you can see that this is showing uh, relationships between fractions. All right, do we have um, any questions about any of these resources that we've looked at so far? Um, it wasn't so much a question. Carla Kozak had put in a, a good link in the chat window. Um, and um, the thinkingblocks.com website. And again, it provides a lot of visual models. So I don't know, if Carla, if you want to talk about it for a minute or anything like that, or if you want to give. I'm not sure how how well we're doing for time, um, Kara. If you want to wait till the end, people can maybe visit it. But Carla, go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Kara, to interrupt. Um, just the whole idea of the models. This Thinking Blocks website, I think, uh, um, also supports the the what you were talking about. Um, I actually haven't played much on it, but the little bit that I've seen, I think, is wonderful. So um, do test out, uh, try out the Thinking Blocks website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Great resource. All right. Um, the last thing that we want to talk about with our interventions is that when we are looking at uh, developing an intervention plan for students, we want to make sure that it's not a, um, a brief covering of the material and then moving on and not coming back to it. Research tells us that we need space learning over time and that when we present information to students, um, we need to come back um, to uh, that learning um, and give them additional opportunities for that. So as we're looking at our intervention time, Let's say we have 20 or 30 minutes with a small group of students. We might spend five minutes or so previewing vocabulary using either the Freyer model or the six-step process for building vocabulary. That is six steps that Marzano um, found to be uh, most effective in research. And basically, the, um, giving the pictorial representation and putting the, the vocabulary into their own words are the most important parts of that, he found. Um, the next portion of that intervention time could be looking at mathematical understanding and having students actual work problems with manipulatives, um, with the concrete, then the representation, and then the, ma uh, the uh, abstract. And then previewing tasks that will be coming up in the classroom um, in the, the core instruction. Um, so that could be um, a, a portion of what um, we put in place for intervention time for our students. Now, I want to spend just a very few minutes talking about math assessment, and then we will come back and have some uh, question and comment time at the end. And I would love for you to share information about strategies. And I saw someone ask a question about Singapore math, and we can come back to that um, after we're finished. I do know many systems that have used Singapore math and have been very happy with it. Um, as we're looking at assessment for math, um, when we are trying to find a tool, again, we need a, a screening tool and a progress monitoring tool. Um, there are tool charts um, for math assessment on the What Works Clearinghouse site. Um, we won't take time to look at that now, but you can look at tools that have been screened um, by the US Department of Education. Again, there is um, these are our um, broad um, concept tools. They are not linked to any specific uh, curriculum. They are simply those basic skills that we talked about at the beginning and measuring those. Um, we want to look at um, also some sites where we can get some tools for free. I've given you a couple of those, Intervention Central and SuperKids.com. Both have um, curriculum-based measurement builders so that teachers can go in and create their own tools. Um, so those are certainly available. Um, the most common tools um, used by most school systems for math would be um, AIMSWeb as being the most common purchase tool. Um, but there are many out there that are on the market that are available. 
here is a screenshot of AIMSWEB. I apologize, I have to keep turning my mic off. I'm having some coughing here, so <laughs> apologize for that. Um, well, this is a screenshot from AIMSWEB. This is math computation in a sixth grade um, uh, probe. And so you can see um, this um, sample. Most um, math probes uh, in universal screening and progress monitoring are 20 problems. And it's um, uh, students uh, complete those, and you can do that as a whole group. Here is an eighth grade probe um, for math um, concepts and applications. When we're looking at the math assessments that you have already um, within your province, um, these two tools can be used for um, screening uh, as well. Um, they are um, available to you, and you may already have uh, concepts in those, um, or have access to those, sorry. Um, as we're looking at these, um, Carla has asked the question um, if anyone is using um, Marilyn Burns' new math reasoning inventory. I have not worked for the school system that's using that. Has anyone done that? I don't think so. Um, but Carla gave you that link, and you can certainly look at that. Um, as we're looking at these intervention tools and assessment tools, I'd like to, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I'd like to give you a, um, a chance to ask some questions. And as far as the, um, the Singapore map, I do have many school systems uh, near me who have used it and have been trained in that. They really like it. Carla said she um, likes it and um, that it is a very useful tool. Um, as, far, as far as specifically using it as an intervention tool for Tier 2, most of the school systems that I have seen use it within Tier 1 um, and, and use it through differentiated instruction with students. Now, what questions do we have? And you feel, uh, feel free to use your microphone or type them in, either one you would like to do. And again, too, if there's anything that you, you know, would like us to go back to or to cover over again, um, please feel free to ask um, or re request. And we can certainly go back to the, some of those things, too. So I can see Leslie's just got, um, is typing in. So we'll wait her response. But please pick up your mic as well, Leslie, if that's uh, faster. I was just going to ask what everybody thinks of Exam Bank. I haven't found it particularly useful for students who are already struggling. So just what do you think of it? Yeah, Leslie, um, we put this in here as more of a universal screening. So yeah, not, not really designed. Um, well, both of these as well aren't designed really for children at the intervention levels. But say, for example, if you get a, a child who's unfamiliar to you and you haven't um, you know, got all the information on him or her yet, it could provide a universal screening. But yeah, I agree. They're not, they're not really appropriate for, um, for helping children along. And it's the sort of initial screening. And then once they're in their sort of RTI um, or intervention group, they're going to need some sort of other assessment ongoing. I'll let Kara add to that. Thanks. Yes, one of the things that you're, you need to find in your universal screening tool as well as your progress monitoring tool is a tool that is very quick and easy to administer. And with math, um, they are, once you get into actual math computation and problem solving, they're given to a group um, at the same time. So quick and easy to administer is, um, is usually uh, covered. But what you want to look at is, are we looking at broad skills? So if, if you look at this example from the uh, concepts and application, we're just looking at the very broad skills here. The other thing that you need to remember is if you're going to use it as a progress monitoring tool, you must have multiple forms of that and be able to administer it as often as weekly um, to look at, is the student making progress as they are um, receiving this inter, uh, intervention instruction? So when you're looking for a tool, 
those are, are some very important criteria to keep in mind. And Carla has just put up the link for Easy CBM. I often recommend that to schools for, um, for both reading and math. Um, if you are using it for a single classroom, it is free. Teachers can sign up for a free account with Easy CBM, and you can administer that. It goes all the way through eighth grade in reading and math. A little bit different types of probes in reading than um, Ames Web, but very similar in math. If you want to use it as an, an entire school or, or a division, then they have a version um, that you pay for. And actually, the free one is now called Easy CBM Lite. And that is free for teachers to use. But for a division or for a school, um, they have a, um, a version that is a um, little bit cheaper, I think, um, than perhaps Ames Web, um, but is still a per, per student per year um, um, cost. And it um, also has your online uh, data management. So it's a good tool um, for being able to look at um, progress over time. And if you're using the tools um, that we talked about earlier, the programs for, um, for intervention that are like Academy of Math, um, that has your progress monitoring uh, built into it and the universal screening, really, um, as far as, well, not universal screening. It has your placement, your diagnostic once students are identified, and then your um, progress monitoring built into that. Um, so you can use um, these tools that Carla has listed here um, that are available in your area as your universal screening tool. Um, a, provide them to every student in the school, look at where students fall below um, expectation. And the, your division will set a cut point on that of what you are going to look at for working with students in intervention that may or may not be um, the standard cut point. But where, where do your students fall and, and what do you need to establish as your cut point? And then how are you going to, um, um, then you have to decide how are you going to progress monitor those students once they get into the interventions. And as Carla has put um, up on your screen, that um, CAT4 can be used uh, as well for a screening tool. Other questions? You're a much quieter group than we had last week. <laughs> Go ahead, Carla. OK, here's just a, a um, kind of a reflection that I'm having. Is it possible to use our program of study with the way that the achievement indicators are listed, could we tweak that to make it a screening tool? And I don't know, Tara, if you are familiar with our, our curriculum. I'm, I'm not sure. I, ha I have looked at it some, you know, of course not having taught it, not that familiar with it. But yes, you certainly can um, look at your program of studies and, and look at those outcomes that students are working on and then use the tools um, such as Intervention Central and um, the Super Kids to develop your own tools. And uh, that is much easier to do in math than it is in reading. Um, so it, I think I'm answering your question, Carla, but I, yes, m many school systems do that and develop their own. Other questions? You are a quiet bunch today. <laughs> All right, Carla, I'll turn it back over to you. OK, well, I was just going to say, I know there's a couple minutes left, and I'm not sure if you want. I'm just going to put this resource in. And I know some, some people may be familiar with it already. Um, but this link that I'm just putting in the chat window is a fabulous video. Um, about a math, used at tier one, but a math strategy called My Favorite No. Um, and Kara, maybe I'll get you to talk about it, but we can kind of do our wrap up and then if people want to view it um, on their own, it is available on YouTube because uh, it would probably take us over the time if we viewed it. Um, but so I'll let you introduce it and then I can tell the, do the little wrap up as well. OK, thanks, Carla. Yeah, my favorite no is a great um, uh, formative assessment uh, procedure that a teacher um, uh, in, I believe it was New York, um, developed. And you can actually view it and many other um, uh, 
strategies on a website called teachingchannel.org. Um, one of my favorite resources to go to. But my favorite no uh, is a warm-up activity um, that a middle school math teacher demonstrates in the video. And um, um, she basically gives all students a warm-up problem. Um, they all solve the problem on an index card. Turn in the index cards, and just as with an exit card, she um, goes through them and sorts the ones who got it right, the ones who got it wrong. But she takes her favorite of the ones who got it wrong and works it for the problem. And the reason it's her, it's her favorite is that the student had some understanding of the problem, but made some mistakes that are typical in the classroom or are typical. Um, with students performing that kind of, of um, function. And so this class uh, helps to um, solve correctly the problem. It's an excellent resource and um, just a really great way of um, using formative assessment in Tier 1. Um, it could be used in Tier 2 with students if you had a small group to help them uh, talk through um, what they are um, using. Um, what they're working on that day, um, but it um, it does get students to reason through what they are doing, which is what we want. And one of the keys of math instruction is um, to have students be able to explain what they're doing, to explain the processes, um, and be able to verbalize all the things that they are doing as they are solving problems. So Carla has put up there the link for teachingchannel.org. And again, that is a great resource. I, I very much enjoy watching um, teacher examples from Teaching Channel. All right, Carla, I will turn it back over to you if we don't have any more questions. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks for all of the um, resources and links and lots of food for thought. Um, Again, when you uh, close this Illuminate window, you'll be redirected to a sur survey gizmo. So please do fill that in. It's great to get the feedback. Um, likewise, again, you know, if you've got a, I think the, the video is about five minutes. If you've got about five minutes, uh, a great little watch to get some some wonderful ideas. Um, so thank you, and I'm going to pause the recording. But again, feel free if you do have questions or comments. So thanks a lot, and thank you very much, Kara.